years before I ever stepped into a Unitarian Universalist church. The words of Emerson, Thoreau, and the other transcendentalists caught my attention and ultimately, I believe, set me on the path to become a minister. And now, following that same path, like Emerson did, leave the confines of parish ministry. None of us will ever accomplish anything excellent or commanding except when he listens to this whisper which is heard by him alone, wrote Emerson. I used to believe that transcendentalism, transcendentalism was an unfortunate name for the movement because what I saw as its heart was the eminence of divinity, the ever-present and ever-accessible sacred made manifest in all nature. It wasn't a complete misnomer, however, because there was a sense of transcendence because they held, because of the eminence of divinity, because of all beings had divine nature, then in each of us is an element that transcends our apparent individuality. That's the name. There is something in us that transcends us. There is something in this flower that transcends the flower. And in that transcendence, we are all connected. There you go, transcendentalism in a nutshell. There you go, that's all you need to know. But Emerson put it this way. He said, standing on the bare ground, my head bathed by the blithe air and uplifted into infinite space, all mean egoism vanishes. I become a transparent eyeball. I am nothing, I see all. The currents of the universal being circulate through me. I am part or parcel. Now, William Ellery Channing, the Unitarian minister that defined what it meant to be a Unitarian Christian at the time, he said this about transcendentalism. He said, transcendentalism, as viewed by its disciples, was a pilgrimage from the idolatrous world of creeds and rituals to the temple of the living God in the soul. It was a putting to silence of tradition of, and formulas, and the sacred oracle might be heard through intuitions of the single-eyed and pure-hearted. Amidst materialists, zealots, and skeptics, the transcendentalist believed in perpetual inspiration, the miraculous power of will, and the birthright to universal good. He sought to hold communion face to face with the unnameable spirit of his spirit and gave himself up to the embrace of nature's perfect joy as a babe seeks the breast of a mother. Where did we lose touch with this language of transcendentalists? I once had an argument with my college American lit professor over transcendentalism. He insisted that it was primarily a literary movement and that ran its course and then faded away. And I insisted it was more than a literary movement and that it did not fade away, that it was still alive and well within the walls of Unitarian Universalism. I was relatively new to Unitarian Universalism at the time and was was overjoyed to see how you know, you know, the readings of how many Emerson and Thoreau readings we have and how important transcendentalists were that Emerson himself was a Unitarian minister. So I was excited and said, no, you were wrong, it did not die. He being a New England Congregationalist, United Church of Christ, he was familiar enough with our movement to accept my argument and because he was the chair of the English department and I was an English major, I accepted, I accepted his argument that the literary component of the movement <coughs> did indeed fade away. Compromise is always good. <laughs> but now, after a year 
years as, as a Unitarian Universalist and, and a minister, I'm going to amend my argument. Yes, transcendentalism did work its way into 19th century Unitarianism, and it had a profound effect on the movement. There was even something called the transcendentalist controversy. <laughs> controversy is always good. But somewhere along the way, I think, what was transcendentalism became corrupted. We lost touch with it. Take, for example, Emerson's self-reliance essay. I would dare say that most Unitarian Universalists would argue that self-reliance is an essential element of modern Unitarian Universalism, and that we might even reference Emerson's essay. Yet how many fully understand Emerson's take on the subject? So when we read Emerson, when we read self-reliance, when Emerson talks about self, it's not a small s self ver version of us. It's the big S self. Our self is part of the larger whole, that which transcends us. That is the self-reliance. As he wrote in the Oversoul, within us is the soul of the whole, the wise silence, the universal beauty to which every part and particle is equally related, the eternal one. When it breaks through our intellect, it is genius. When it breathes through our will, it is virtue. And when it flows through our affections, it is love. It is genius. It is affection. It is love. The idea of Emerson's self-reliance has been corrupted, leading it to be used to justify what some have called a hyper-individualism, with emphasis on our little selves cut off from the whole. The first principle of Unitarian Universalism, the inherent worth and dignity of every person, and our seventh principle, respect for the interdependent web of all life of which we are a part. These two principles invite us to paradoxically hold up the supreme importance of each individual, every life in one hand, and the supreme importance of the whole of life in the other. And it is when, within the tension of this paradox that we must learn to live in love. Yet, too often, I believe, we put greater emphasis on that individual at the expense of the whole. We don't like to hear, for example, how our individual food choices create undue pain and suffering while doing irreparable damage to the planet. An article in the UU World magazine called The Power of Community, The Peril of Individualism, by Reverend Cheryl Walker, she makes the point that true community doesn't happen unless everyone is willing to give up some of their own identity as an individual to take on the identity of the group. If this doesn't happen, then we are merely a group of individuals sharing common space but not becoming a community. She, too, was very critical of this hyper-individuality that she sees in Unitarian Universalism and is represented, you know, and it's not just within our walls, it is common in our world today. But as for us, I believe when we gave up the poetic language of transcendence, when we gave up the language of the soul, I believe we lost touch with our own soul as a movement. When God became a four-letter word in too many of our churches. <laughs> when we made an idol of reason and pursued the most somber of Sunday services. Eschewing even the word worship in many cases. Not here, thank you. Because, well, why do we not like this word worship? Because we've discarded even the notion of transcendence. Worship implies to many people that there is something we must do bow down to. Self-reliance doesn't allow for that. When we lost 
the notion of transcendence. When we lost the language of the soul, we lost touch with the deepest part of ourselves. And I'll be frank. For most of my career as a UU minister, I was an active participant in this process. Oh, on occasion I would, you know, play lip service to the old transcendentalist ideals, but I always played safe. <clears throat> that wasn't until last November. The two things happened that offset my reticence to push beyond the self-imposed limits of my role. First, I joined several hundred clergy from around the country in Standing Rock, North Dakota. We were there in support of the water protectors and to make a public stand against the doctrine of discovery, a centuries-old Catholic doctrine that still stands as legal precedence for our treatment of Native peoples in this country. And then the second event was the election of last November. This longer hair, the beard, they're visible reminders for me of the internal shift that occurred for me at that time. When I realized that I could no longer play small, no longer play it safe, no longer conform to the expectations of others, that I had a role to play in turning this world around. We all do, but you know, I can only do something about myself. Now many of us are familiar with this quote from Emerson's self-reliance essay. A foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of little minds, adored by little statesmen and philosophers and divines. But that's just the beginning of that quote. It goes on. It says, speak what you think now in hard words, and tomorrow speak what tomorrow thinks in hard words again, though it contradict everything you say today. Ah, so you shall be sure to be misunderstood. It is bad then to be misunderstood. Right? Pythagoras mis was misunderstood. And Socrates and Jesus and Luther and Copernicus and Galileo and Newton and every pure and wise spirit that ever took flesh to be great, says Emerson, is to be misunderstood. This past year, I've started posting meditations on my personal Facebook page. These meditations are generally inspired by whatever rolls through my head on my morning walk on the beach. They are my pretty much unedited thoughts and feelings. And I find that some, looking back, are contradictory. Some are thoughtful. And frankly, some I wonder, what the hell was I thinking? <laughs> but the simple act of writing and releasing them into the world has helped me better live up to Emerson's call to speak my mind regardless of the consequences. A month ago, one of my reflections gave rise to this sermon. And if you read the blurb, you read the reflection. I wrote that the human experiment has reached a fork in the road. One path will essentially continue the path of domination and control that has brought us to this point. The other is the path of belonging and connectivity. I choose to live indigenously. I choose to be linked so immeasurably to a place and a people as to lose awareness of the separateness I once imagined. We have tried the opposite. We have tried living as mere individuals, striving to dominate each other and our environment. And it has led us to this precipice. Since then, the idea of living indigenously has completely captured my imagination. Thought a lot about it. What does it mean? To live indigenously means simply that we choose to let go of ways and things that hinder our sense of belonging. The birds of the air and the flowers and grasses of the field do not worry 
because they never doubt their place in the web of life. We of little faith suffer the pointless pain of worry and cynicism because we do not see the truth of our own inherent worth and dignity. Shorthand is that living indigenously is transcendentalism updated for the 21st century. As Unitarian Universalists, we recognize that religion is not merely what we do one day a week, but informs all aspects of life and living. And it is for this reason that I've decided to start a blog called Living Indigenously. And on that blog, readers, participants will explore what it means to live on this planet like we belong here, and not as colonizers and invaders. And my goal is to spread the news beyond the confines of Sunday morning sermons and the limits of day-to-day -day church life, to get transcendentalism back out there as a movement. It will be a blog for Unitarian Universalists and for non-UUs where ideas about living indigenously can be explored and shared and evolved. And my hope is that it will become first an online dialogue, which will then hopefully lead to local groups starting up to serve as a community for those trying to live more consciously, to move beyond fitting in, to seek true belonging. What do you think for a moment on those ideas of fitting in and belonging? I've done this now with, um, with children of different ages, as little as, you know, kindergartners, and junior high, senior high groups. And I ask them, what's the difference between fitting in and belonging to a group? And they know right away what the difference is. Fitting in is changing yourself to conform to the group norms. Belonging is knowing that you're there, you're accepted for who you are and what you do. They know that and sense that right off the bat. They recognize the difference. And when they ask them, what do you like better? Belonging. Belonging. Renee Brown, in her new book, The Quest for True Belonging and the Courage to Stand Alone, she points out that loneliness is on the rise. In spite of the growing trend to gather in groups of like-minded people. Groups where we fit in. She writes, huddled behind the bunkers, we don't have to worry about being vulnerable or brave or trusting. We just have to toe the party line. Except doing that is not working. Ideological bunkers protect us from everything except loneliness and disconnection. <coughs> so the more that we gather in the confines of our protected conclaves of conformity, because we're we're safe because our politics are all the same and our, our ideas, you know, certain words we use about God or don't use are, are, you know, we all share these, we all conform to some norm. The more disconnected we become from our deepest, truest selves because we have mistaken fitting in for belonging. feels good to fit in at first. But belonging requires courage. Belonging requires courage. from the heart, the word, the Latin word for heart. 
to move beyond merely fitting in to discover a sense of belonging requires us to be vulnerable. Now, fitting in requires little to emotional investment, but belonging requires commitment and letting go of the illusion of control. To answer the call of belonging is to answer the call of the divine light that is at the core of the heart and the spirit, the breath of life. True belonging, as Brene Brown defines in her book, is the spiritual practice of believing in and belonging to yourself, yourself, so deeply that you can share your most authentic self with the world and find sacredness in both being a part of something and standing alone in the wilderness. True belonging doesn't require you to change who you are, it requires you to be who you are. Now Brene Brown comes to this conclusion by way of academic research and study. And it amuses me to no end that her conclusions align so neatly with the transcendentalists and other mystics from around the world and throughout all time who have been saying similar things for eons. In her book, she makes the point that this is what the world is seeking, what the world is needing. to move beyond fitting in and seek communities of belonging. If you can't find the communities, have that sense of belonging so deep in yourself that you belong everywhere and nowhere. I believe it's time for us as a movement, as a religion, To let go of our identity as this rational religion. And to again seek the heart of Unitarian Universalism. The message of the transcendentalists. And the language of transcendence. It's a metaphorical language. That's all it is. But words, metaphors, have power. They speak to us at a place where rational argument can't get to. It's the same place where music touches us. Prayer is just spoken music. To be afraid of words because how other people interpret them lets them define them for all people moving forward. I'm not calling my, my blog Neo Transcendentalism. Because it's not just neo-transcendentalism. And I don't want to carry forth that baggage that has been put on that idea of self-reliance by people who probably haven't read Emerson since college or high school. Now I'm sharing this with you, this blog, the idea of the blog and what's going on because I'm looking for contributors. I'm looking for people to participate in the dialogue. I know I'm not alone within our movement. And when I leave the ministry, I'm not leaving Unitarian Universalism. Just as Emerson never quite left Unitarianism. But I hope they'll join me in this discussion 
be up and going this week. Livingindigenously.com. And I hope that to be part of something we can all participate and spread the good news of Unitarian Universalism to a wider world who are starving, thirsty for this wonderful language that is our legacy. So be it. Amen. Blessed be.